So the next topic is a stacks. Stacks for streaming API for XML. It's sort of the brand new API for parsing. So here we are going to compare pull parsing versus push parsing. And uh, as I said, this is a brand new uh, parsing technology. Uh, fixing the problems of Stacks and DOM while taking advantage of the benefits of Stacks and DOM. So you can think of Stacks is sort of the combination of good things from Stacks and DOM as we are going to see in a few minutes. So here we are going to talk about what is and why we want to use Stacks uh, as opposed to as opposed to Stacks and DOM. And uh, then we are going to see two different APIs that are supported through Stacks. One is Iterator API and the other one is a Cursor API. There's a slight difference, uh, not much difference. Uh, then we'll talk about Streaming Filter API. Uh, and then we are going to see uh, which one to use, Cursor or Iterator APIs on what situations. So let's talk about the concept of pull parsing versus push parsing. So pull parsing is a parsing model in which application itself has a complete control. So application ask XML data, and that is basically what Stacks is based on. On the other hand, push parsing is where SACS is based on. So push parsing is, is not the application, but the parser itself is pushing uh, the data to the application. Okay, so. Uh, pull parsing, I, as long as you actually get this part, this blue colored part, that's good enough. So in pull parsing, the client, meaning your application, only gets uh, XML data when it explicitly asks for it. So this is, you know, the application pulls the data from the parser. On the other hand, in push parsing, uh, the parser sends the data whether or not the client is ready to use it at the time. So this is actually what the SACS does. SACS parser, you know, it doesn't care whether your application is ready or not. It will just call the event handler to push the data. Okay, so this is actually, the reason it's called the push model is because the parser is pushing the data to the application, regardless whether the application is ready to handle it or not. So advantages of pull parsing. Okay, so with the pull parsing, the client has the complete control. What that means is that the client, by the way, by client, I'm talking about client of the parsing. So we are talking about your application. Okay, the application have uh, uh, control in terms of it knows it can actually start, proceed, pause, and resume uh, the uh, based on the need. Okay. Uh, so, uh, by contrast, in pu push parsing, the parser control the application thread. So, parser will just push the data to the application through the uh, the, uh, the callback. Okay. So, the uh, you know big advantage of pull parsing is the it is the application who has the control of when to read data. Okay. Uh, so, it it can start, proceed, pause, and resume at any point that uh, it, it it sees the need. So this is a continuation of advantages of pull parsing. So pull card, pull clients, meaning the uh, the application can read multiple documents at one time with a single thread because it can control, uh, you know, when to read and when to pause. It can actually read multiple documents, okay, uh, in a single thread. Uh, the stacks part, the pull parser, okay, uh, the meaning the. Um, um, uh, your client application asks the Stacks pull parser to filter out some elements that a uh, client is not interested in. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, in push parsing, by the way, whenever we say push parsing, we're talking about stack, uh, the uh, SACS. Okay. So whenever we say push parsing, we're talking about SACS. In SACS, uh, you don't have a way of actually telling the parser that I don't want these particular elements. Okay, so you have to still receive it, and if you do not want it, then you have to discard it. Okay, so that is, uh, you know, not as efficient as in stacks. In stacks, you can tell the parser, uh, passing the filter object, you know, filter these elements, uh, so that I don't actually receive those things. Okay, next time I ask for the uh, the element. Okay, so it has more control in terms of filtering. 
uh, pull parsing is easier to use than DOM for writing out. Okay, so as we have seen in our DOM presentation, uh, DOM API is a very low level, okay, and very complex. Uh, it doesn't really reflect your application level APIs. Instead, it's actually reflecting the tree structure, like uh, add a child and things like that, which has nothing to do with your application, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, so, uh, pull parsing APIs are uh, is actually providing a bit easier uh, uh, API than DOM. Okay. Okay, so what is and why stacks? So we actually talked about why we want to use stacks a bit uh, over SACS and DOM, but uh, here we are going to actually talk about it in more concrete detail. So, uh, so let's talk about what is a stacks first. You know, stacks is a representation of pool parser. Okay, so it's a streaming as opposed to in-memory tree of DOM. Okay, so it's like it is streaming in the same sense uh, like a SACS. Okay. Uh, so it is streaming uh, as opposed to in memory tree of DOM, Java, <coughs> Java based, event driven, and pull parsing API as opposed to push parsing of SACS. Okay, uh, I'm going to actually talk about event driven things in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, so whenever you ask for an element, it is actually captured an event. So that's the reason it's called event driven. Okay. Uh, okay. But it's not like an event driven, async event driven like in SACS. Okay. Uh, for reading and writing XML documents. So this is another difference of stacks from SACS is that it allows you to write XML document. Okay. So uh, the uh, the um, uh, uh, stack, stacks enables you to create bidirectional XML parser that is fast, relatively easy to program, and has a light memory footprint. Okay, so if you actually see the um, uh, benefits and uh, the disadvantage of using stacks and DOM, uh, basically what stacks is trying to do is uh, the uh, to to solve the problems of those drawbacks of stacks and DOM, yet try to provide features, compatible features of SX and DOM. So that's basically what this bullet is all about. Uh, Stax is a latest API in Jack's P family, provides an alternative to SAX and DOM for developers looking to high performance system filtering, processing and modification, particularly with low memory. Okay, so it's a streaming, so it doesn't require a lot of memory like in DOM. Okay. Uh, the uh, it lets you write uh, as well Unlike SACS, okay, and uh, the uh, it lets you do filtering, okay. Uh, the unlike uh, the, uh, uh, the SACS, okay. So basically, you can think of stacks is uh, is a new API, new parser uh, technology, uh, fixing the problems of uh, SACS and DOM while taking advantage of the features of SACS and DOM. <coughs> okay. Okay, so why stacks? So it supports a pull parsing, and uh, because it's pull parser based, it gives parsing control to the uh, programmer, meaning application. So it allows the application or programmer to ask for the next event. So again, uh, whenever it asks for the next item to read, it will ask for it, and that is actually captured in the form of event. Okay. Uh, so Stacks was created to address the limitations of SACS and DOM, as I mentioned in previous slide. So let's compare Stacks against SACS. So Stacks is a pull parsing, while SACS is push parsing. Okay. Stacks enable the clients are generally easier to code than SACS clients. Okay. Uh, the one advantage we already talked about is filtering, right? Okay. Stacks is bidirectional API, meaning it can both read and write XML document, unlike SACS. While SACS is read only, and uh, so another API is needed to uh, to write XML document. So SACS does not support writing, while Stacks does. So this is a comparison among the multiple uh, parsing APIs, Stacks, SACS, and DOM. We also have a track AX. That's actually transformation. Okay. 
So if you think about the API type, uh, stacks is pull and streaming, while stacks is push and streaming. And DOM is in memory tree. And translation is actually using DOM underneath. Okay? Uh, but it also supports XSLT rule, meaning style sheet. You can provide a style sheet uh, to transform. Okay. Uh, the in terms of easy of use, uh, stacks is easier uh, to use, while stacks is medium, and the DOM is easier to use. Well, you know, in terms of what you can do. Okay. Uh, the uh, transex medium. Okay. Uh, expat compatibility. So in this case, uh, DOM and transex uh, is actually uh, you can. Basically, I think this one should be only on this one. Okay. Uh, in terms of CPU and memory efficiency, so Stacks has good memory usage and Stacks same thing, but the DOM depending on the size of the XML file and uh, same thing for Trend AX because again it's using DOM internally. Uh, in terms of forward only, so Stacks forward only, same thing as Stacks. DOM, it doesn't have to be forward only, it can go back and forth, same thing with this guy. Okay. Uh, read XML, so they all read XML, and write XML, so the uh, the only thing that allows you to write is stacks, DOM, and TransAX. Stacks does not support writing, and create, read, update, and delete, uh, so only DOM lets you do that. <coughs> okay, so there are two types of APIs for supporting stacks. Uh, one is called the iterator API, and uh, it is more convenient than cursor API, and uh, it's easier to use than cursor API. Cursor API is considered is fast and a bit low level <coughs> than iterator API. Okay, so iterator API first, and then later on we are gonna talk about curse APIs. So iterate API represent XML document stream as a set of discrete event object. Okay? And again this event object you are going to pull this event object uh, as a developer. Uh, so these events are pulled by the application okay? instead of pre being pushed and provided by the parser in the order in which they are read in the source XML document. So it is still reading XML document in stream format, stream fashion, okay, streaming fashion, okay, but it is the application who ask or who pulled uh, the, this event. So these are the classes in iterator API, so XML event, XML event reader, XML event writer. So these are the event types. So start document, start element, end element, character, characters and entity reference and things like that. So you can think of these are pretty much the same uh, the, uh, as uh, the uh, in, in, in SATs uh, you have uh, event handlers for each of these events, right? Okay. So it's the same deal as far as event is concerned, but here it is the application who ask for each of these event type, okay, rather than uh, being pushed by the par parser. Okay, so the XML event reader API. So this is for reading the XML uh, document. So XML event reader interface extends iterator, and it does have a very simple uh, APIs. So you can get the next event, and this XML event could be uh, start event, start element, or end element, uh, start document, and things like that. And now you can actually has has next, okay? Uh, so basically, uh, the uh, you can check whether there is actually extra event uh, being the uh, the uh, weighted to be pulled. You can also pick, okay? So this is actually retrieving one. This is just picking it and this is one just checking it. Okay, so pig is basically returning uh, the uh, the actual, uh, not, yeah, it, it actually returns the type of it but it's not pulled yet. Okay, so the actual pulling happens on this. So this is the code. Okay, so here uh, you get the, uh, you, first of all you are going to create XML event reader object from the factory. 
okay so there is XML input factory object from the factory object we are going to create XML event reader object by calling create XML event reader uh, then you, you know here you provide a name of the file and then this is the actual code in which you are pulling uh, the event so here you can call has next as long as there is a, a, a an event in uh, wi wi waiting to be uh, pulled you can get it by calling next event and uh, you know you can this one you can actually see what uh, type it is and you can do whatever you want okay so if it's an element you know you might want to read attributes and things like that okay so the next one is XML event writer okay API so as I said before stacks let you read as well as write okay so here uh, we just learned how to read using XML event reader now we are going to learn how we can write as well using XML event writer okay so stacks has writing APIs um, and the XML event writer class extends XML event consumer interface and uh, you, so basically XML event writer X as could actually act, uh, act as a consumer which can consume events okay so what you can do is that you can use XML event reader and then you are going to immediately use that event passing XML event writer uh, you know make it possible to read XML document from one stream sequentially and simultaneously right to another system okay you don't have to but this is possible okay so you know basically what you can do with XML reader and XML writer is that you read it and then you do something with it you know maybe you are going to change all text node to the uppercase or something like that then you can actually write it using XML event writer so this is the XML event writer interface it has a flush method close method add method and add attribute method so these two methods are used for uh, you know the uh, writing and uh, writing an event and adding an ad attribute so this is an example where we are reading it and then we are writing it uh, in the same uh, the uh, same application okay so we have so this is the same code we have seen we read uh, the uh, the file so this is the uh, uh, the file that we want to read okay and uh, and and uh, then we we have uh, event reader XML event reader object and we also create XML event writer object as well and in this case the place that we are going to write things out is the system dot out uh, stream object okay and then basically we have a while loop okay so in this while loop we are going to read uh, one by one and then if uh, the uh, if what we want to do in this code is that if event type is characters okay then we want that write that characters okay uh, we also actually could be yeah so this is an example of some kind of business logic so here if it is characters and everything else we wanna just write it back you know write as it is okay but if it is a characters what we want to do is that we want to do some business logic execution okay so in this case this get characters event method is uh, here and in this case what we want to do is that if there is a string of the first and last freedom we want to change it to the current time so whenever there is this string in the uh, in the XML document we want to just change it to something else in this case we are going to change it with uh, current date and time okay uh, so it's very simple business logic uh, so the whole point is that we can read it then we can perform some business logic and then we can write it uh, by using add method and later on we can actually flush this is where we are going to actually write into the output stream okay alright so we are going to do exercise 1 and 2 okay so let's take a look at exercise 1 and 2 Uh, so exercise one is playing around with event reader read only and uh, exercise two we are going to in fact use both event reader and event writer okay so again the code is uh, provided so basically uh, you are going to just open the NetBeans project so let's just open these two uh, all the project from uh, the 
stacks, Jax P stacks here, and sample net means. So open all this project, okay? Because basically we are gonna just play around each of these projects. So the one that we are going to play with is first event, okay? So let's run this guy, right? Run it, and uh, basically the output is going to be like this okay so you know we basically uh, reading it and uh, we just display the uh, each node okay so you can think of this one is I mean it's pretty much the same thing as we have seen in the sax uh, demo uh, sax uh, the uh, hands-on lab exercise but uh, this is actually done through the uh, XML uh, you know XML reader meaning pool parsing okay so if you take a look at the code Again, we are using the same uh, XML file, book catalog file, okay? And uh, so this is the code. So we create XML event reader, okay? Object, and then we call has next and has event, uh, next event, okay? And then we just uh, display each event type, okay? And we just keep doing it, okay? Uh, and you can also do context sensitive Java documentation in NetBeans. So if you want to actually see Java documentation of XML event, uh, let's see. So let's take a look at the source code. And uh, let's see XML event reader. So right click it and uh, show Java documentation. Then you should be able to see Java documentation of XML reader. Okay, so this is a convenience when you're using an IDE, whether that is a NetBeans or Eclipse. Or sometimes you want to see uh, Java documentation of a particular class. So that is one exercise I'm going to ask you to do. Okay, all right, so that's Java documentation. And the exercise two, here we are going to read and also write, okay? And then what we want to do is when there is actually this, uh, uh, you know, some string, uh, we want to replace with the current date and time, okay? So let's actually run read and write. Right click the project and run it. And this is the output. And uh, again, yeah, so this uh, in this case, it just changed to current time. So December 10th, 1104 and Eastern time, 2013, okay? So this is pretty much the same code that we have seen. Uh, so, you know, we want to replace this string with the current date and time. So that's the same code that we have seen in the slide, okay? So we, you know, it's the same code, so I'm not going to really explain it here, uh, except that, again, this uh, get new characters event is, you know, we just replace. If there is a string like this, then we're going to just change it to current date and time. Okay? All right. Uh, I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes to try this exercise. Okay? So let's uh, pause. Okay, so the next API is a cursor API. So this cursor API works pretty similar to iterate API. Okay? Uh, let's see how it that how that works. So if you see iterator API, uh, API is very convenient. Iterator uh, style API is convenient and easy to use, uh, but it involves some overhead. Uh, so parser needs to create an event object for you, okay? So that when you uh, retrieve the next item, that is actually captured as event object, okay? Uh, the uh, the curse APIs providing a bit low-level API. So for applications where high performance is paramount, you might want to use cursor-based API instead. So uh, you are going to use what is called the XML stream reader, uh, and then you are going to use next method that delivers integer values. So instead of uh, returning event type, it will use integer value. And uh, then you are going to compare that integer value uh, you know, to see what uh, what uh, what you know node type it is okay so it represents a cursor with which you can walk an XML document from beginning to the end and the cursor can point to one thing at a time and always move forward never backward usually one info set element at a time so 
As far as the operational model is concerned, it works exactly the same as iterator API, okay? But it just gives you a little bit of lower level, lower level API, okay? So let's talk about the XML stream reader. So it does provide XML uh, stream reader and XML stream writer, okay? So it includes access of method for all possible information available from XML information model, including document encoding, element names, and attributes, and things like that. So we're going to actually see this XML reader methods in the following slide. XML stream writer provides method that correspond to start element and end element event types. So let's see how that works. So these are the methods that you can use in XML reader methods. So get name, get local name, get namespace URI, and things like that. Okay. So you know you have to actually call these things after you figure out uh, what uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, what that integer value get uh, represent. Okay. So if it is in fact the uh, text node, then you're going to call get text. So compared to iterator API, it's you who do a bit more work. In the case of iterator API, in a sense, you know, the uh, the parser does these things, stacks parser does these things for you. Okay? So it's a matter of who's doing the work a bit more. Uh, the caveat, not all of the getter methods work all the time. So for instance, if the cursor is positioned in an end tag, then you can get the name and namespace, but not the attribute of the uh, not the attribute because attribute is probably handled in opening uh, element opening open opening tag, okay? Uh, or element text. Uh, if the cursor is positioned on a text node, then you can get the text, but not the name, namespace, prefix, or attributes. So text nodes just don't have these things. So basically, if you're calling get a method uh, incorrectly, then means it will just return null. So this is the get event type method. So you are going to find out what is the event type by calling get event type. Okay. So uh, the uh, to find out what kind of node the parse is currently positioned on, you can go. You can call get event type method, which returns one of these uh, seventeen int constants. Okay. And then you are going to call the next method and returns integer code corresponding to the next parsing event. So it just returns integer code and then you are going to figure out yourself you know, what that integer code means. Okay. Uh, and uh, so this is the example code. So here we are going to read uh, the, uh, the file, XML uh, input source file, uh, as uh, XML stream reader object. Okay. And uh, here we are going to call next method to get the integer value. And then we are going to compare integer value whether that represent end document or start document, you know. So you have to actually figure out uh, what that event is all about. Uh, you know, integer value, you are going to find out, you know, what uh, whether that is the end document or start document or start uh, the end document or start element or end element and things like that. And then you are going to do whatever you want to do. Okay. Uh, so optimized use of XML stream reader. Since the client application control the process, it is easy to write separate methods to different elements. Um, so for example, you can write one method that handles headers, one that handles image elements, one that handles tables and things like that. So what it means is as a programming model, programming practice, I mean, you know, what you can do is uh, depending on the event type, okay, so you get the integer value and then you check whether that is a start element and then you are going to actually call different uh, the uh, method that handles uh, you know, so in this case, we are going to call the process head because this is, you know, is actually uh, the head, ele head element, and this is body element and things like that. Okay, uh, it's just the uh, programming pattern, which is probably not critical. Okay, so that is the uh, stream reader. Uh, now here we are going to uh, learn how we can use a stream writer. So stream writer. So this is actually kind of uh, the uh, the um, uh, nice to have. Uh, so as we are going to see, so stream writer has a start element, write start element, write end element, write characters, and then there are a bunch of other uh, methods. So the uh, this is how you can uh, write things out. 
okay so this is very convenient uh, it really provides easy of development so if you're trying to create uh, this XML fragment okay uh, let's say we have XML and then we have uh, you know root element of hello okay and it does have uh, the uh, the uh, uh, yeah so basically namespace and uh, then you know the uh, another element called the uh, hello uh, world and then it has the uh, ending tag of hello okay if you try to create this XML fragment in DOM, you know you have to actually create uh, the uh, the uh, this hello element, then you have to create a child element, then you have to insert it, you know, and characters has to be created as a text node and things like that. So, you know, the writing XML with DOM APIs is going to be very complex. Now, if you're using the XML Stream Writer, this is the this is this is what you're going to write. So you, you can see this is a lot more uh, intuitive. So you get the stream write object, and then you're going to say write start document, and uh, write start element, write default namespace, write characters, write empty element, and uh, write end element, and document. So it's a lot more straightforward. There is no child structure APIs involved. Okay, so it provides a lot easier APIs to deal with in terms of writing out. compared to DOM. Okay, so um, so this is another example. So here, you know, you're basically creating a document and then we are going to create an element. Then we are going to add an attribute to the element. Then we are going to write characters, okay, for that greeting. And then we are going to end document. Again, with this very simple five lines of code, you know, we should be able to text write the XML document that representing a single uh, element with the text. Okay. Again, if you try to do the same thing with DOM API, it's going to be a lot more complex. Okay, so we are going to do exercise three and four. Um, so let's take a look at the exercise three and four. So here we are going to exercise uh, the cursor and uh, the uh, the API, which is the XML XML Stream Reader and XML Stream Writer. That's all. Okay. So if you if you actually run this guy, you know this is what you're going to get. Okay. Uh, so here this is the all namespaces, and then we actually basically writing things out. Okay. So let's run the cursor API, uh, uh, cursor application. So just run it, and uh, this is what you should get. Okay. Mm. It's just representing the same XML document, but uh, you know we actually have a namespace is kind of prefixed. Okay. All right. All right. So if you take a look at the code, um, the important code is here. We have XML reader, and uh, then um, then when the XML stream reader is created, it's positioned at the start document event. Okay. So uh, you know, so we can assume the first time we actually call. Uh, event type. Uh, it should be. Uh, it should be. Uh, the, uh, it should be start document event. So we can just call print start document uh, method, and then we are going to be in a while loop. Okay, just going through, just getting the next one, and uh, then uh, the these functions. So then we basically check uh, the uh, you know the event type, and then we are going to actually do something about it. So if you actually take a look at the print start element here. Uh, yeah, basically we just check whether that is the start document or not. If it is not, it will just pass it. Then it goes to the next and things like that. It goes to the next. Uh, so uh, it basically this uh, the uh, uh, this is actually being passed as uh, uh, the um, um, so XML event type. Yeah, so it gets event type, and where is event type and XML? Oh, okay, XML. Yeah, so uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, then we actually call this print method. Uh, basically, just checking the uh, event type uh, and do the right do the things um, uh, in relation to that event type. Okay, so as you can see, the code is pretty much. Kind of close to the uh, um, 
uh, iterate to API, but uh, we just deal with a little bit of low-level APIs. Okay, uh, that's cursor and uh, the uh, exercise four. Uh, this is a case that we are going to actually write things out. Okay, so uh, XML stream writer. Okay, so it basically, okay, so it looks like uh, it just run it and uh, it's going to actually create uh, output.xml file. So if you actually go to uh, the files and uh, go to writer and output.xml file, so this is what gets created. All elements are explicitly in the XML namespace and this is what gets created. Okay, so let me just delete this file one more time maybe this is from my previous execution so there is no output XML file then I'm going to write it again okay I'm going to run it again right so now it actually creates uh, the output that XML file okay so uh, in this case we are basically using this uh, uh, XML uh, the uh, the uh, writer XML stream writer object it just write things out again is very a lot more straightforward than DOM API so that's the benefit of using uh, this API Okay. All right, I'm going to give you guys about 10 minutes to try this exercise. Uh, the last topic is filter. So as one of the advantages of using uh, stacks was you can ask the parser to filter things out, okay, uh, so that you don't have to deal with uh, unneeded uh, event types or even you know, the nodes. So for that purpose, uh, it provides a stream filter class. So stream through the XML, only pay attention to the ones I care, so elements and namespace uh, kind of thing. So basically stream filter is the class that you are going to provide the filtering logic. So you can filter anything you want, okay? Uh, it, it provides easy of development in terms of uh, writing your XML application. Uh, performance, lower level filtering and stream dances uh, lightly, quickly and efficiently. So uh, basically the stream filter is used by the parser to filter things out at the lower level. Okay, So the overhead of parsing XML document uh, uh, should be uh, reduced. So this is the uh, stream filter classes method accept. Okay, So you know you're going to actually call accept uh, and then you actually provide the uh, the reader object, okay? So uh, and then here, this is the uh, uh, code filtering code uh, that you are going to provide. So this is an example. So if I want to accept only start element and at end element events, uh, and if I want to uh, filter out everything else, uh, basically uh, there is accept method that receives the uh, stream reader object. And here, this is the filtering logic. We just check whether that is the start element or end element. Everything else, uh, we are going to say return false. Okay. Uh, if it is either start element or end element, then we return true. That means I want to have it. Uh, this is another example. So here we are basically uh, even checking. So I'm only interested in the start element events. Okay. So if it is not, uh, then I'm going to return false, okay? And I also check a uh, particular namespace. So I'm actually checking whether it actually is my desired namespace or not, okay? And uh, so I'm actually doing two things. You know, first I check whether that is a start element, and then uh, whether that element contains the uh, desired namespace. Uh, okay, so I think one of the questions that was asked was, you know, in our previous uh, parse, uh, uh, the the uh, the exercise, uh, the 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 namespace. Yeah, I think I'm going to respond uh, by writing. Okay, so I'm going to just move on. All right, so stream filter example results. So you know what gets uh, displayed. Uh, you know, suppose in this case, uh, the, uh, the it will just display only the uh, uh, the starting element like. Uh, book catalog, assess book and book and things like that, okay? And uh, in check whether there is a namespace. So in this case, uh, this one is ignore. Uh, and uh, so, you know, basically uh, the, it will just display uh, the start element and the name, uh, which is, yeah, so this I think is a question, why is it actually displaying this? So if you think about it, uh, the, the each element has a namespace, right? 
okay so this is in fact the uh, the namespace is basically URL okay prefix just happen to be an alias okay so when you actually display the whole thing in the form of a namespace aware a, the uh, the node uh, element then you know so it's actually displaying this namespace okay because a prefix is just the uh, an alias this is the real namespace okay Okay, so that is exercise five. So let's take a look at the. Uh, um, let me actually finish up the presentation, and then I'll give you guys uh, to finish the exercise five. So one of the question that was asked was, you know, when to use cursor and when to use iterator API. So uh, the we know that iterator API is easier to use, but with a little bit more overhead, and cursor API is a little bit lower level API, uh, but provides higher performance. So, um, you know, when Stax was designed many years ago, uh, at the time, the mobile devices were not really powerful enough, okay? So when they want to have these APIs to be used on mobile devices, they want to actually provide an API that is extremely highly efficient, okay? Uh, as efficient as possible, okay? So that's the reason they actually come up with these two APIs. And this day is probably not much a big deal because mobile device is actually very powerful. So you can certainly use uh, the uh, the iterator API without a problem, okay? Uh, and uh, so same application should be able to run on mobile devices and desktops and servers and things like that. But initially, the reason they come up with these two different levels of APIs is to provide low-level API that could be used in memory-constrained and CPU-constrained uh, mobile devices. So recommendation is if you are programming on a memory constrained environment like a Java ME uh, and uh, more efficient code, then you want to use Cursor API. Uh, if that's not the case, then you can use Iterator API. But I guess at this point, you know, Iterator API is actually use usable on all devices. Uh, if you, in general, if you do not have a strong preferences of one way or the other, then use Iterator API. All right, so uh, what we have learned is what Stacks was, why we want to use the Stacks, and we actually covered uh, Iterator APIs and Curse APIs, and also Filter APIs, and we also talk about when to use what. Okay. All right, so uh, Filter API is basically uh, we filter things out. Okay, so if you run the filter uh, application. And uh, it will just display a bunch of. It, it will just display uh, the uh, the uh, start element and end element. Okay, uh, everything else will not be uh, displayed. Okay, okay. So if you take a look at the code, so this is the uh, my stream filter class. Okay, and uh, the uh, uh, and then uh, the uh, so when you create the uh, when you create the reader object, you are going to provide uh, the filter object, okay? And in terms of filter class, we should have uh, accept method. So here, uh, you know, we are basically checking whether an element is a start element or end element. If if uh, the node uh, the is not one of these, we'll just return false. Okay? So very simple code. So I'll give you guys four minutes to finish this exercise and we are going to move forward.